So, the first wave. It's finally come to an end. This is how I'll be addressing all of the Fate Grand Order events that happened before their first light version rerun ever took place. Thus, that includes every event from the very first Narrowfest, around the time the game was born, until, ironically enough, the second annual Narrowfest. But don't worry, we won't have to argue the semantics of that qualification in the comments since, spoiler alert, neither actually appears on this list. And what is this list? The short answer, my favorites, duh. Featuring the few events which stuck out in my mind, as remarkably positive experiences based on both their offerings and mechanics, as well as my own unique perspective launching into them for the first time. And the second. But the long answer explains why this list is so short. See, this was originally going to be a top 10, until I realized that there were too many events which I simply blazed through so expected of me as a master, I didn't really give most of them that much thought, save for a few cute praises. Juxtaposed, there were other events that I thought were kind of cool, but introduced certain mechanics which would end up better utilized in later scenarios. With that in mind, I cut this easily down to a top five. And even then, I struggled to fill the list with a fifth entrant for those same exact reasons. So I hope you're okay with a top four, Masters! Woo! I know it's a rather exotic number, but I'd rather share honest-to-goodness descriptive opinions as opposed to forcing myself to find endearment in a placeholder. I don't make these videos to act like I work at the fucking <laughs> office. Number four. Da Vinci and the Seven Counterfeit Heroic Spirits. It's Christmas. But, but even, even better. better. It has Jean. But, but even better. better. And this shop, shop is a miracle for our universe. universe. Hmm. A worthy place to start this tiny but mighty list. And while the story for this event essentially cemented one of Fate Grand Order's most iconic and greatest breakout creations as little more than a joke character by this exact point, I admittedly didn't notice it that much at the time, since I was absolutely buried by, oh, excuse me, skill gems and ascension materials. Every single ascension material! At the time, I had such a great time farming this event. Ugh. Because I could actually feel the progress in my servants flowing from my very fingertips. I felt like a truly loving, responsible master for pretty much the first time ever. Everybody came out a winner, unless your name is Jean. But hindsight has been a bitch ruining people's fun since the days people learned how to art better than cavemen, and Shinjuku chapter just couldn't come fast enough. Number three, Fate, Excel Zero Order. The Uro Butcher reprising his role as the writer of Fate Zero with a brand new alternate scenario? I'm not gonna lie, I couldn't be easier sold on this event. And the story proves itself to be just as clever and interesting as I could imagine from the man. Lord Elmaloy II, now summoned as a servant, who is, of course, an older, wiser Waver Velvet with superpowers, tags along with your investigation of this new Fuyuki singularity to subvert the Fourth Holy Grail War, tricking his predecessor into to leaving the country entirely and suavely stealing his servant as a result, killing caster Gilles de Ray immediately as one should, never give this class any prep time, good thinking fellow caster, gaining the favor of cutest mother Iris Veal von Einsburn, who, by the way, happens to be housing the Holy Grail inside of her body to grant her family the guaranteed win, and then just goddamn ganging up on Gilgamesh with nearly every single servant on his side. Except for Iskinder. He just doesn't like his face. Although the introduction of the class advantage coin system felt quite convoluted getting the hang of it the first time, the result for doing so turned out to be extremely rewarding, as 10,000 QP only cost two of any given coin, which would be a pittance to earn once a master learned the system thoroughly enough and purchased all of the event-associated craft essences. Honestly, this event was by far the easiest to farm QP, a godsend to experienced players like myself struggling to max their gold rarity server and considering the Welfare Servant one here was a dedicated healer with the potential to spam a party-wide guts application, I found that QP well spent on the overwhelming love exuding from her chest. You drive a hard bargain, mother. Just an overall iconic event, and I'm grateful to its existence. Number two. The Great Tale of Demons, Onigashima. A brief history lesson. 
The Japanese server of Fate Grand Order originally featured both the Rashomon event conjoined to the Journey to the West event, then followed by an 11-day break preceding this Onigashima event. The English server disagreed. No breaks. An obnoxiously difficult raid event, immediately succeeded by a long, tedious grind event, immediately succeeded by this event which happened to have both of these things. It was a brief example of what it must feel like to play this game in South Korea. And yet, despite this, this event did the impossible. I won't deny that it had a slow start with that 5-pip prologue, but after that, I actually felt invigorated to play through the rest, slaughter the raid bosses, farm the stairway to heaven, and purchase my overpowered golden sumo craft essences. Love you too, Fino. And even if I wasn't interested in the story featuring Shuten Doji as a glorious badass by the end, Onigashima heralded one of the greatest, most generous banners in FGO's history. The introduction of Mama Raiko as the SSR, and Ibaraki Doji, while being a spook for affiliating among the same class, is one of the most useful SR Berserkers in the game. And I might just be biased, since I love both of these characters. Regarding Raiko in particular, as I learned from Shi that a man's penis can always get bigger, even over heartfelt tragedy or sheer badassery, <laughs> trust me, I can get it up for more than just her breasts. But despite that, there were also the craft essences, because this event couldn't just stop at its top tier freebies, no, otherwise what incentive would I have to recover for? For it. Dumplings over flowers was something quick servants desperately needed to up their power and performance, and Faithful Companions was easier to max limit break than acquiring five copies of Formal Craft while applying a major NP gain boost to all cards rather than simply arts. And just in case I wasn't having any of that, I would always settle for earning my golden welfare cheat code, Rider Sakata Kintoki. Oh my god, an actually good quick servant. How about that shit? I wasn't kidding when I said this event did the impossible. It completely recovered me from burnout. It tricked me into investing reserves of energy I didn't even know I could muster by being so far above both Rashomon and Journey to the West in its epic story, gameplay, and rewards. Damn. Number one. The Adventure of Singing Pumpkin Castle. How appropriate, since this is the event that earns its first ever light version rerun like I'd mentioned at the start of this video. But, I swear to you, I didn't plan this with that in mind. No, this event doesn't feature the most interesting gameplay mechanics, or provide the most gracious rewards, or even showcase the best story. However, its story does have more heart to it than most other events, with more quotable lines than I can fairly count since so many of its characters are written brilliantly overall for the given circumstances of the plot. In the end, this was all made up from a fragment of the Grail, because Elizabeth Bathory wanted to give me, her master, a private concert. Sure, my ears bled, but my heart grew three sizes the day I read that blissful motivation for the first time, even if her plan to accomplish it was very, uh, well, Liz. It was very Liz. Tuckering me out from so much fighting that I'd want to relax to the vibrant melodies of her bloated vocals. At least her minions are enthusiastic about their jobs, Tamamo throws pies, Vlad knits her dresses, and Carmilla gets out those DAMNED SPOTS! Everything from the story to the festive Halloween style of the mob enemies and the spooky purple nighttime map aesthetic they inhabited are all very nostalgic to me. Even the little painted sign at the front cemetery gate acting dual purpose as a cute plot detailing schedule for my expected timely arrival, but also as a warning of the times at which the event's unique mechanic refreshes the quest is a charmingly clever way of integrating the background that would sadly never be featured in any other event from this first wave. And speaking of this event's unique mechanic, I didn't mind it at all. I liked the urgency of collecting lots of pumpkins before certain times. It gave me a consistent reason to play the game. And even if I happened to miss one of these quests that provided tons of pumpkins, I could still farm for them outside of these quests with some of the best craft essences featured in the game around this time. A max limit broken Halloween princess acted as a superior imaginary element, possibly even superior to Kaleidoscope on single target boss killers. And Little Halloween Devil was great even with just a single copy, and wouldn't receive any one-to-one -one competition until the Prisma Codes event almost a year later. Yet another reason to roll on the true blue Tamamo no Mai's debut, but certainly not necessary. If you catch my drift. And I do hope you get what I mean. 
Just as this would be only the start to the most incredible Ellie Chan trilogy, unbeknownst to anyone at the time of its initial release, this was the event Delightworks finally found their groove with their first grand colorful map display, their first specific gameplay mechanic introduced to liven up the usual dull monotonous farming of miscellaneous objects by adding a sense of urgency. Oh, and of course, how could I forget our very first welfare servant? I mean, MASH doesn't really count. I can't burn her. And I may have tried once or twice, don't at me. Maybe I just love Liz so much that I can only look back on Singing Pumpkin Castle with purple-tinted glasses. I also love the color purple, but it easily has become my purple standard for Fate Grand Order event enjoyment, and I don't think I've gotten so much purple out of an event since... Huh. The next Halloween event, leading the second wave. Gee, I wonder what's topping that list.